This webinar is hosted by the RBL Group, and I'm Joe Hansen, a partner with RBL. Uh, as you know, we are featuring Dave Ulrich, who's a co-founder of the RBL Group, a University of Michigan professor. He's known as the father of modern HR, and I think Dave now is a father of, modern, of uh, human capability. So um, we're delighted to have you. Also featuring today and working with us is Andrea Allen, our um, Director of Business Development. Thank you for setting this up, Andrea, and Michaela Panowick, who is the uh, brains behind uh, all the webinar production. So thank you uh, as well. Quick agenda. We're going to get started right now with Dave sharing his insights. Um, when Dave is finished, Andrea will share uh, some other uh, solutions and programs featuring Dave where you can learn um, on selected topics in human capability. Um, and then we'll turn the, top, the time back to Dave for final thoughts, and we'll finish with a, just a brief survey at the end. So that's our agenda. Dave, again, thanks for being here, and we welcome you, and we'll turn the time to you. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of a busy day wherever you are. I know we've got people joining who uh, sent me notes who are friends from a whole bunch of different places, and I'm grateful to be with you. A lot of you send in questions. I spent some time last night. We got about 40 questions. You're going to get from Andrea uh, some responses to all 40, because we believe that our job is not to tell you what we know, but how what we know helps you respond to your questions. So if I don't answer them today in explicit ways, you'll be able to get a response to those questions. And the other thing I want to say is the ideas I'm going to share are not just from me. They're from a whole host of RBO colleagues. And you can see a host of those colleagues. Um, who we just have such respect for. And I can look at each name and think of what great people they are. Mike Panawick, for example, is one uh, that Michaela thinks is a great person, as others, um, and Mar, thanks to them. The question we want to answer is really simple. And I was asked by Joe and Andrea to say, can you do a webinar with everything you know? And I said, I need two minutes. Actually, I need hours. But I want to start with a really simple question. If you're listening, how can I or how can we, my company, create more value? Our message in HR is that HR is not about HR. It's the value we create for someone else, both as an individual and as a member of the HR or business team. So as you listen to this session, put in that question in your mind. What am I hearing that will help me create value? It's not about what I do. It's about the value that I create because of what I do. I'm going to cover a lot. And uh, this is one you'll see again at the end. Uh, you may want to take a picture to get a copy of the slides. Uh, I think people like slides. I like slides. But if you if you close your eyes and listen, it may be better. But you can have a copy of the slides that, that, that will tell you where we're going. But that question that we're asking is really simple. What can I do or what can my company do to create more value? That's the question. And the framework is pretty simple. We're going to give you a bunch of ideas with impact that come from the RBL colleagues. The stakeholder value comes through human capability. The introduction is going to be kind of a stipulation that we all know now is the time. What are the new assumptions of the future of work? When you go back into your company, help your business team. And if you're the business leader, that's the team you direct. If you're an HR person, you're a member of that team. Look at the new assumptions driving our business. And then there's three ways we create value. HR is not about HR. Change the way we think about HR. HR is about the value we create for others. Two, we contribute that value through what we're going to call human capability. And three, we need to upgrade HR. Again, that sounds really simple. I've got a lot of slides to go through and we'll get there. But that's what we're going to talk about. If you have a burning question or comment, I'll just stop once in a while and see if there's any burning, burning question. And again, you're going to get, it was so fun last yesterday to go through your 40 questions and provide answers to all 40, uh, because that's what we hit our uh, RBL try to do. So let's get started. I think it's fascinating. Some of you are old enough to remember, and if uh, maybe you're too old and you can't remember, but Fast Company did an article in 2005 that said, why we hate HR. I remember because I got interviewed by, uh, by a global newscast. And they interviewed me in New York and Steve Hammonds in his office, who wrote the article and said, Mr. Hammonds, what do you think? He said, I hate HR. Mr. Roberts, what do you think? I like HR. And we went back and forth. I hate, I like, I hate, I like. 30 seconds later, the interview was over and it was stupid. Even my wife told me it was stupid. Well, look at what they just published. Why more people want to work in HR. 
now is the time. Now is the time to think about the HR issues that drive our success. Why is that? Why is now the time? How do I, as an HR person, help make sure that the business case and the rationale for HR is shared not only with me, but with the other people throughout my company? Now is the time. We at RBL have a three-step logic, environment and green, assumptions, the future of work, and then how we manage people and organization. So this is just simply a context for why is the time. The environment, the world around us is changing. Technology, we clearly get intangible value, regulatory. I think I'll use this slide and start at the top right. We know we live in a digital revolution. Probably the most common question I get right now that were in your questions was AI. AI is changing the world of work, but it's not only changing it in terms of technology, it's changing it in terms of people and how we manage. What AI does is it does a synthesis of the past. It looks at a data set of all information out there and summarizes that data. It doesn't predict the future. We need people, the people, to predict the future, not to just live the past, nor does it separate good and bad data. I recently looked at a, a summary of skills of HR using AI, and it looked at our research and somebody who had studied their LinkedIn friends with 20 people. We have data from 28,000 people. They would interview 20. It looked at that equal. The digital revolution puts more pressure on people. Political toxicity, mental health, economic, civil unrest, ESG. All of those issues are the context that say, we've got to create new assumptions about work. And again, we could spend forever in that green bucket. Context is the kingdom. Content, the work we do, is the king or the queen. Lots of people are interested in future of work. We believe future work starts with four assumptions in purple. Assumption number one, connect what we do inside the firm to what happens outside the firm. I remember a session with a group of senior HR people recently. I said, what's the biggest challenge in your job today? And they wrote it down. And I said, if you shared, solve that challenge, that's inside the firm, would a customer buy more products? Would an investor be more likely to invest in you? Our view is that HR needs to create value, not only inside, but outside. That a future work assumption is we connect. We can start outside. We succeed in that changing marketplace because of HR. Or we start inside with some of the HR practices so that we build outside. Our assumption of the future of work is the boundaries are going to be removed. Assumption two is a phenomenal one. We live in an uncertain world. Clearly, we had it in COVID. But since COVID, look at what's happened. Inflation, deflation, recession, growth, globalization, technology. That uncertainty continues. A lot of people say, chase the uncertainty. That's false hope. Give up hope. I don't know what's going to happen. I'll just wait. What we're discovering is an assumption of the future of work is that we've got to focus on certainty in the uncertainty. Joe, are you on the call? Can I? I am, Dave. Super. How many kids do you have? Four. Do you know with assurance, how many grandkids? 11. Do you know with assurance where those 11 grandkids are going to grow up? I don't. You don't? Do you and your wife know what they might study? Um, at not school. at all. <laughs> not at all. You live yeah. in uncertainty. <laughs> Yo, what do you and your good wife know about how you'll feel about your grandkids? No, and I pick your grandkids because I don't know how you feel about your kids. But how do you know how you'll what, – what will you and your wife feel about your grandkids that you absolutely know? We'll shape them and help them become whatever they can become and want will, to do, right? Will you, will you love supporting them? them. Yep. No matter what they do? Uh, that's the hope. That's the hope. Yeah. You don't kill them along the way, right? <laughs> By the way, for Michaela, Ryan, I don't have copy. I can't see any pictures. I can't see anything but my slides right now. So I can't see Joe. But I hope you could feel Joe's certainty in a world of uncertainty. I hope in our world today, an assumption of the new world is we harness uncertainty, not by chasing it, but by finding certainty. Assumption three. Assumption one, inside out. Assumption two, certainty. We now know Joe will love his kids. Um, and uh, I was going to ask if any of his kids had tempted or had tested that love, but I won't ask. We live in a world of paradox. 
I love listening to people talk about from to, what am I mean, from operational to strategic, from long-term to short-term or short-term to long-term, from command and control to a compassion and care. No, we got to do both, long-term and short-term, top-down and bottom-up, social good and economic success. Paradox means we navigate those tensions. In a company we worked with once, we identified 10 paradoxes they might face. You can pick a number. Um, number three, do I work independently or do I work collectively? And the answer is both. And so we believe that in the future of work, we have and also. How do you learn to navigate those inherent paradoxes? I think those are exciting paradoxes. And number eight gets a lot of attention right now. Do we show care, compassion, empathy, or challenge competitiveness? And the answer is yes. I love this exercise. You look at where you focus the day, A, B, C, one, two, or three, and where you need to focus tomorrow to navigate it. And finally, assumption four, personalization. Personalization means we have to care for each person. We've gone through a whole series of employee engagement work, satisfaction, motivation, engagement, commitment, experience. How do we now personalize for every person? and scale that, which is a paradox. How do you personalize and scale? And the personalize is how do we then tailor a work setting, hybrid work, wherever you work? I'm gonna take a quick stop. Let me show you the logic again. The logic is the environment's changing, the assumptions of the future of work. I'd like you to think for just a minute, we just had a meeting with a senior executive team of a large uh, firm. We asked them to think about their assumptions. What do you gotta work with? Inside out, number one. A, harness uncertainty. What are we certain about? Our mission, our vision, our values. How do we manage, navigate, see the paradoxes? And how do we personalize work? By caring for the person and scaling that care. Let me just stop for a second. If there's, Michaela, I'm just going to take um, maybe two questions. If anything burning came through with those issues, what we hope, I'll, I'll do one more piece. All of that leads to rethinking people and organization. The environment's changing. We get it. We stipulate that. The assumptions are new. We see an evolution in the HR field. If you're in HR, in gray, we did personnel, terms and conditions of work, and also, the navigate paradox, we did HR practices, functional excellence, and also in red, human capital. We align those practices with business. And now in the yellow column, we focus those because of those assumptions outside in. And two, we deliver organization, leadership, as well as talent. We call that human capability. So that's the first piece I wanted to cover. Now is the time to reinvent HR. The Fast Company article is not a fluke. This is a new set of work assumptions that are putting HR center stage for boards, for executives, for investors, for customers, and for regulators. Michaela, just if you could pick two questions or summary of questions, I'll try to respond to those. Um, there's one question from Sheila Hines Edmondson says, how do you distinguish certainty from clarity? I'm not sure I would, but well, certainty I think is built on a set of values. What am I, I can be clear, but they're not my values. I'm clear that there may be a political leader I don't like. And by the way, everybody can name one. Um, I'm clear about that. And I may be certain you can be clear for me, the, the certainty comes from a set of values and beliefs. Joe loves his children. That's a set of values. It's also clear. So if I have a two by two, clarity and, and certainty can go together. I can be clear, but it's not certain. I don't know what's going to happen. So I, I, I'm not sure that distinction is, is incredibly powerful, but I'm intrigued. Clarity usually goes with certainty. Great question to think about. Thank you. One more. Um, another question from Gaurav uh, Kapil. My burning question, there is too much to do. I'm in a startup and wherever I'll focus, there is work to be done. How to start, how to balance what business wants today and what I see that they would need tomorrow. You know how we usually do it is we ask you, what do you think you should focus on? I think Gerard, the right question is to say, what should I focus on that will create value for somebody else? Because sometimes what I want to focus, and there, there'll always be too much to do. Gerard, if you're young um, and you're younger than me, I know that. You'll always have too much to do. You'll always have too much to do. And, and that's going to often be true. And so deciding where I focus is not what I want. 
It's what I can do that will help deliver value to someone else. And that becomes a criteria. We've actually done a paper on that that you can find. And if you send a note in, we'll make sure that you get a copy of it. We've come up with a really clear opportunity formula. It starts with impact, which is what I just said. How can what I do impact someone I care about? Two, benchmarking. How am I doing? Do I need to get better at it? And three, variance. Is this an area where there's room for improvement? So th the simple answer is focus on what creates value for someone else. And there's a more complex algorithm for that. Boy, that was fun. Joe, would you add anything to what we've just said so far? No, I, I think it's great, Dave. I might ask another question along here. Okay, let's take one more. Uh, okay. Dave? Well, go yeah. ahead, Gayla. Another question would be um, from Dr. Verenda, and it's, can assumptions be dysfunctional? Oh, huh. Dr. Verenda, what do you think? Absolutely. Because I can have very bad assumptions. Um, I hope those assumptions, <laughs> I can have bad, very bad assumptions. But hopefully those assumptions that we just laid out, let's go through them real quick. We laid out four assumptions that, that we think shape the future of work. Um, hopefully those assumptions, correcting the inside and the outside, harnessing uncertainty with certainty, navigating paradox, they could be dysfunctional if they take you away from the creation of value. Because the whole logic is that those assumptions in the middle drive value in the environment. And if the assumptions take us away from that value, we obviously get in trouble. So the test of the assumptions is that the link to the environment, and then will it help build people and organization? I hope you'll go to your company and ask the question, are we getting more attention on reinventing HR today? I'm betting the answer is yes. I'm betting the answer is yes. We can stipulate it. I've just gone through the assumptions of future work. What does that mean? We're gonna suggest three things. And again, really quickly, number one, HR is not about HR, it's creating value for others. The question Gerard Bu asked is so good. I just have been, I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit and I've seen some studies lately where they ask uh, business leaders or HR leaders, what do you think is important in the future? Gerard, for me, for us, what's important in the future is not what we think, it's what the data tells us will create value for a customer, for an investor. Because what we think may be true, and that's back to that great question, doctor, the assumption may be wrong because we have an unconscious bias. Are we creating value for someone else? And we can track some of that. How do we do it? Again, this is at the top end of the human capability pillar. We're moving from human resources to human capability, which is creating value outside in. So here's a test. If you're in a room with someone else, uh, you could do it. I've done this uh, and I've had people report and do a score, but we always get the same. What's the most important thing that my business or HR leaders in my company can give an employee? Psychological safety, absolutely critical. Meaning, belief, purpose become better, belong, all the above, or none of the above. Almost everybody says five, and they're wrong. Here's an assumption, doctor, that we believe is so critical. The answer is six, none of the above. The most important thing we can give an employee is an organization that succeeds in the marketplace. Let me say that again. If we don't succeed in the marketplace, there is no workplace. Let me say that again. If we don't succeed in the marketplace, there is no workplace. Our view is that success of HR is not what we know and do. It's the value we create in the marketplace with that simple question, so that. I was in a session about a year, about a year and a half ago, um, and I was really intimidated. It was with Amazon Web Services, uh, 100 people, most PhDs in statistics, science, computer science, brilliant, brilliant people. And I thought, what am I going to say? I have a degree in English and a PhD, but, uh, and so I started by trying to get their attention. I said, what do these companies have in common? And I listed some digital, again, they were a technology company, Compaq, Kodak, Sears, Toys R Us. Somebody yelled out, they all went broke. And I yelled back, I consulted for every one of them, <laughs> which I had. That was actually kind of embarrassing. They laughed, which was a good thing. And I said, I'm here to help you. And then I said, let me tell you what I learned. All of those companies were superb at the blue stuff, but they didn't succeed in the marketplace. Kodak missed information and imaging cameras. Toys R Us missed Amazon. 
our job in HR is to connect what we do outside in. So if I were to say to you, what's the biggest challenge in your job today? Is it an administrative challenge? Kind of the H the personnel role efficiency is an HR best practice, compensation, staffing, training, hybrid work is a strategic HR linking it with business. We believe you should put a so that behind that answer. And the so that leads me to an outside in logic at the top. How will what we do create value for a customer, for an investor? And so this is the logic we have at RBL to help us move forward in a powerful way. In the middle, there's a lot of human capability initiatives. I'll talk about that in a minute. That create value for senior executives, for customers, for communities, for investors, for boards, for employees. Our job in HR is to figure out the initiatives that will create value for those multiple stakeholders. A colleague I'm working with right now, she's doing exceptional research on progress, which is a nice metaphor, in the community. How do we manage the way we organize and do work so that our community reputation, and that could be ESG, it could be social development goals from the UN, it could be social responsibility, corporate social responsibility. How do we do things in yellow inside so that our communities have a better effect for us? You've heard it said, our people are our most important asset. We think our people are our customers' most important asset, that what we do should be connected to our customer. So I'm gonna stop again. I've gone through some material really quickly. Uh, Joe, before we do questions, do you have anything you'd add about that? Remember now the top line, we recognize the challenges to create human capability. Now is the time. Second, we don't focus on HR. We focus on creating value for others. Joe, anything to add to that? Then we'll take Michaela a couple more questions. No, I, I love the outside in focus, Dave. And um, one of the questions here was a paradox of we've got to do everything on the left to be able to survive in the marketplace on the right. Right. And um so it starts with the outside in. You got to work back all through the the whole HR systems and align them to be able to deliver that. Yeah, and and Joe, what I love is I don't care where you can start inside or outside, but you got to got both. For example, a few years ago, the and every few years there was a hot HR topic. A few years ago was employee experience, which is an evolution. It's always building on something else: motivation, commitment, engagement, commitment. Now it's employee experience, well-being, personalization. And I read this works on employee experience. And I got less than 5% of what was written was on customer experience. Our unique view, at our, we're not unique, but our strong point of view at HR, employee experience, let me go back to this, so that, I'm going to go back to this slide, we want to build a functional expertise on employee engagement experience so that our strategy happens so that our customers have a better experience. So when we work with a company, we go, what is it you're trying to do with your customer? How will the employee experience drive that experience? One of my friends, a, a colleague of us who was at RBL, who was brilliant, said HR is about people. And we all nod our heads and say, yes, people are part of HR. People are our most important asset. And his comment was, our customers are people. Our investors are people. HR should be connecting people inside and outside. And that logic becomes a criterion. Uh, Gerard, your question before was, how do I know where to focus? Well, focus on the things inside that will create the most value outside, not just the assumptions. And doctor, I can't remember your name who had the question on assumptions can be wrong. My assumptions may not be what my customers expect of me. And so we want to begin to build that inside out. Let me stop and get a couple questions if we got them just to see what people might say. Absolutely. So um, LC Lowe said, would you use the ROI on people as a way to value HR's contributions? I'd use that as one. Um, I think one of the better ROIs, let me go back to this chart, is with investors. One of the things we have found with investors is that 80% of a company's market value is intangibles. So for us, the ROI of HR is return on intangibles. How does what we do in human capability in yellow drive investor confidence in our future? Wow. And we did re we do research at RBO. We do a lot. We found that about 25% of the intangibles are tied to the human capability issues. So one of the things we love to do is go to a firm and say, we went to one company. I'll tell two quick stories, uh, and I'm worried about time. And we said, your market value is $10 billion and you're 20% below the price earnings ratio on intangible value. 
So if you were equal, you'd be worth $12 billion. And the HR person said, oh, don't share that with the executives. That'll make them feel bad. And my comment was, our comment was, I was with Norm Smallwood, are you nuts? They should feel bad. Another company said to us, the same data, they were worth 40 billion market value. They're 10 to 20% below. The CEO looked at us and said, uh, you don't think I know that? That's why I'm getting pressure. Can you help me solve that? And we believe that our research shows that about 25% of the ROI return on intangible in the investor mindset is tied to HR or human capability. Let's do just one more question and good luck. I, uh, I can see we've got more questions coming in. Send them to us. Uh, we spent yesterday hours responding. We'll respond to them all. Uh, but Michaela, any one more if, if you see one? Yeah, absolutely. So Marcella Murray, how to work with this assumption to develop a thriving ambidextrous organization? I love the term ambidextrous. You just named another form of paradox. That assumption, well, I don't know which assumption, but you create value through managing the paradox. You say, our customers want low price, our investors want high profit. <clears throat> How are we going to navigate that tension? And the third player in that game is the employee who wants reasonable value for their argument. How do I in HR engage that dialogue? We want to make sure investors get their value. We want to make sure customers get their value and employees get their value. And as we navigate that tension through a dialogue, and, and we've got a series of things around navigating paradox, looking at the extremes, getting a dialogue, getting a productive conversation, uh, appreciative inquiry is one of the terms that's been used with that. Marcella, we in HR can facilitate a dialogue that navigates paradox, it doesn't solve it. I think one of the things we bring is getting that ambidex, ambidexterity is another term for paradox, into the dialogue with our executive teams. Um, I'll take one more question for sake of time, if there's one more, Marcella. Um, absolutely. So Nawal said, does it mean we need to up our business acumen? Ha! Ah, well, let me ask Nawal, I don't know what company you're with. Um, let me ask you some simple questions. What's your company's earnings? What's its revenue? What's its profit? What's its price earnings ratio? Who are the three biggest competitors? Why do companies buy from you? Who have been the recent companies who've left you, customers who've left you and gone elsewhere? What's your correlation between employee engagement or experience and customer engagement? What's your net promoter score? What's your market share of targeted customers? Now, Noella, if you got all of those right, people are going to want your resume. You got it. You've made it happen. Yes, HR has got to be able to answer those questions. We can't play in the business unless we know the language of business. Let me make that easy. I mentioned earlier, my undergraduate degree is in English. I read novels to get a degree. When I started my PhD in business, I was intimidated with finance. Finance is the language of business. It's 20 to 30 words. Anyone on this call can learn 20 to 30 words. EBITDA, net present value, intangibles. Learn those words, become comfortable with them. So let me summarize. We want to create stakeholder value. We're giving you ideas. I hope you're making a note. I'm going to give you a test at the end. What did you hear that you might be able to use? And I hope we can sh share some of that. But HR is not, now is the time. Your business is paying attention to this. What do I got to do? HR is not about HR. It's creating value. That's an assumption. It's a way of thinking. Number two. What do we do in this human capability column? We create marketplace value now at the top of that column in red. What do we deliver? This is a great discussion. HR is at the table. Some people say HR should know the business. We've been after that for 20 years. We're at the table. What do we talk about? We do a test if we had a smaller group. How many of these initiatives has your company tried in the last three years since COVID? Agility, yes. Technology, AI, that's a hot topic. Diversity, hybrid work, leadership, culture, leader, reskilling, customer focus, skill-based organization. Whoa. Sometimes when we go into that meeting and we throw the latest, here's choir resignation, Monday misery. I don't know what it's called anymore. Monday something. It just feels like I'm in a Disney ride at Star Wars and all these things flashing at me and we get cynicism. We need a taxonomy. Now, I know that word is not common in English or any other language. And I know the article at the bottom left, you've probably all studied. It was one of the articles I did uh, for my research in my early career. Classification is the science of simplicity. And we've all lived with it. Go to a restaurant that has no categories. So here's a main course. Here's a coffee. Here's a dessert. Here's a salad. 
you go, ah, oh, that's weird. Go to a library with just random books. Have you ever been into a used bookstore with no organization? Select a car that just has random cars, investments without a portfolio, a class registration. Everything we do in our lives is organized around ta taxonomy, except this. Look at that list. Today we're doing hybrid, tomorrow we're doing ESG, the next day we're doing reskilling, then we're transforming. We need a taxonomy. At RBL, we've been very careful around the word human capability. We believe there are three things, four things that create HR value. It's no longer piecemeal, it's integrated. In red, and I'll show my fingers again, I don't have a camera, I can't see, I can't see myself, but um, in red, my fingers represent talent. Anything related to people, the individual, the competence, the workforce. In blue, my fist is the organization, the capability, the workplace. In green is leadership. Those three factors come together through the HR services in purple, the functional HR department. We believe that all of those initiatives can fall into those three categories. Am I managing my people, employee primacy, resignation, reskilling, well-being, diversity? Am I managing my organization in blue, technology, reinvention, culture, collaboration? Am I managing leadership? Am I managing in purple the HR transformation? That topology for us becomes so critical because when I go into this meeting, finance has a topology to manage cash flow, to manage the income statement. Marketing has a topology. Who are the best customers? We categorize them. Operations has a topology, taxonomy. In HR, we ask three questions. How well do we manage our talent, our organization, our leadership, through our HR services. For us, that becomes absolutely critical and it becomes a foundational piece for growing the HR profession. That's what human, that's talent, capability, that's what organization provides. Now to make that memorable, I do a stupid thing. And again, I hope some of you can see others who are on the uh, call. Uh, Michaela, is your picture visible? Um, currently? Can people see you? When I'm speaking, they would be able to see me, yes. Okay, you're speaking. And Joe, can people see? I won't have you do it. I I have people when I can see them. Here's your fingers. That's talent. Here's your organization. That's the fist. Here's leadership. Here's HR. And then I have people do the HR dance. So if you can see me, you look stupid doing the dance. That's what we bring. And what we at RBL do is we try to bring those four pathways and 38 initiatives together in all of our research, in all of our focus, in talent, here's things we could do, in organization, here's capabilities, in leadership, in HR, we now can say, where should we focus to succeed? And the logic that we get, again, back to Gerard's second question, I want to invest in some of those talent initiatives so that we deliver stakeholder results. I don't want to invest in some of those organizational capabilities so that, or I start with customer. I want to increase my customer score on the right-hand side because of. And as we make that connection, we can fill in this grid in your company. You're investing in a whole bunch of human capital, people, human capability initiatives. We found it's 1% to 3% of revenue. On the columns, they affect employee, strategy, customer, finance, and social responsibility. In the rows, we can invest in talent, leadership, capability. We then, and this is illustrative, through our organizational guidance system can tell you where should you invest to get the outcome you care about. Woo. Let me say that again. So instead of just going to a group of 20 leaders at the executive board and saying, what do you think we should focus on? We can now say, what is it you're trying to accomplish with your strategy? We're trying to reinvent with customer net promoter score, with finance, social citizenship. We now can collect data that says, here's where your red, yellow, green, green is where we should invest. Yellow and white that don't have the impact. That's the logic that we're using. I think I'm gonna stop there for a couple of questions and then I'm gonna blitz a bunch of slides because at RBL, we have detail about talent, leadership, organization, and HR, and I'm gonna blitz them and then get to the HR slide um, so that we have time for uh, to go through the academies uh, at, at 50 after. So a question or two, let's just take a couple if we could. 
Michaela. Okay, so the next question from Erfan is, how can we foster human capability, culture, and mindset in the organization? Very simple. Start by saying, here's the, it, there, it's material, it matters. Whatever the business leader is trying to, when I sit with my business leaders, it could be a board level, it could be an executive team, it could be a local plant manager. What is it you're worried about? Cost will help you. Growth will help you. Innovation will help you. Our job in HR is to help you through talent, organization, leadership, and HR. And when we bring those disciplines in talent, organization, leadership, and HR, we can help any manager inside, a customer outside, an investor, we can help them be more successful. Start with what your business executives and your other stakeholders care most about. Another great question from Icarus Lim. How do we measure intangible values? How do we attribute them to each HR initiative? I'm not sure we can attribute them by initiative yet. We're not quite that rigorous yet. We're getting there. The easiest way to look at intangibles, and there's a whole research literature on that out of Baruch Lev in the finance area. Compare your company's price earnings ratio with your competitors over a decade or your cost of capital. What do I have to pay to borrow money if I'm borrowing money versus my competitors? That indicator tells you the intangibles that either the, inv the investor with stock or with, uh, uh, with cash or with uh, loans makes on your company. For example, if you have a very high confidence, you'll pay 5% interest. If you have low confidence, you may pay 10%. And that's the intangible piece you can get. Our research partitions that into what drives that percent. And we found that 35, 30 to 35% was driven by financial discipline. Do you make the money you promise? 25 to 30% was driven by strategic direction and 25% was driven by human capability. That's the research we have. I'm gonna blitz for a minute. So put on your thinking hats and if you need to get a cup of coffee, get a cup of coffee so you can think fast. Talent, organization, leadership. In RBL, we believe there's three dimensions of talent. In those three dimensions, competence, there's seven, eight things we can do, plus commitment, plus contribution. These are the 10 practices of individual competence. Organization, we believe that, we've written a lot of books, that's not relevant. We believe that an organizational evolution has occurred, that it's not just about your skills or your hierarchy or your systems, it's about building capability in the marketplace. And so we try to create a capability of what you're known for and good at. We've identified firms we've worked with, Amazon Innovation, Disney Customer, Google. These are the capabilities that your company builds. We love to help you audit those. Do I have innovation? Do I have efficiency? Eight and nine. Do I have accountability? Ten. And then we can help you identify which capabilities drive value. In the middle, leadership, talent, organization, leadership. We've begun to create a bunch of books on leadership. That's not terribly relevant, but we've said there's five core skills of leadership. Leaders succeed as strategists when they shape the future. This is bad leadership. They succeed as executors when they make things happen. These leaders have come together, the dogs and the cats, to get the prize. Leaders succeed as talent managers when they engage today's workforce. This is a bad example of engagement where these folks are installing steel pillars in concrete to keep people from parking on pavement outside of a sports bar. They wanna get in their truck and drive home. Obviously, they're not gonna be able to do so. Leaders build human capital. The next generation, the next group of employees. I love this slide because it's human capital. The, the hands are the customer, the child is the leader. Supporting the child are the functions, HR, finance, marketing. The child standing is the consultant who helps build that human capital. And leaders take care of themselves. They invest in themselves. These leaders all have the personal proficiency and credibility to be successful. Your company probably has a competence model. Look at these nine rows. At RBL, we love to build leadership. This company, if you look at those five competencies, strategy, execution, talent, notice most of their competencies are in personal proficiency. We'd suggest they clean up that model. This company has almost nothing in personal proficiency, right-hand column, but a lot in execution, deliver results, challenges, makes decisions. We want you to build leadership for the future. And the leadership is about the assumption. Strategists create certainty. That's the assumption. 
executors navigate the cultural paradox of inside and outside. Number two. Number three, talent managers personalize work, the assumption about work. Number four, human capital make others feel better about themselves. And finally, leaders care for themselves. Number five, take a breath. I have one more piece, but let me stop and I'll do just one question, but I'll do the quick summary. We want to reinvent HR. This is so exciting to see progress that's coming. The headline, now is the time. Number one, HR is not about HR, it's creating value for others. Understand how what we do creates value for the stakeholders inside and outside. Number two, through human capability, talent, organization, and leadership. I think I'm gonna do number three and then we'll see if there are questions and go through the, uh, the, the last piece with the uh, academies. What does that mean for HR? What does that mean for HR? In the last uh, year, every major consulting firm, and some are probably on the phone, have done a great job looking at how do you view HR operating models. You've probably seen some of them, McKinsey, Gartner, they're out there. We've also done this work. I said, we love research. We've done a competence study. Kayleen has done such a good job with Aaron and Mike Ulrich. We've studied data. In the most recent round, we had 28,000 respondents. We've had 120,000 people. We do a leadership capital index. We've got hundreds of organizations, thousands of investors. We've got a guidance system that Harrison has been a part of. Now with over 10,000 organizations, 38 now human capability initiatives. And we've done with Mike Panowick, a study of 7,000 firms who report their results to the SEC. We believe this data tells us what HR contributes and we've seen an evolution. Based on our data and those consulting firms, we've identified 10 dimensions for building a great HR department. You gotta have a great reputation. What are we unified about as a department? Number two, we gotta serve all of our stakeholders, the employees inside, the business leaders, customers, investors. Number three, we gotta have a purpose statement. Number four, we gotta get structured right. And that's what a lot of these HR operating models are about. Number five, we've got to build human capability. We've talked talent, organization, leadership. Six, we've got to get great HR analytics. Six, seven, we've got to use digital. AI technology is so critical to the new world. Number eight, we've got to innovate practices. Number nine, we've got to be great HR people. And number 10, we've got to build great relationships. Again, if you work with us at RBL, our focus is not the activity, but the value it creates. We've tested those nine, we hadn't yet tested digital in this study, but we're testing it now. We test those 10 dimensions against the value they create for customers, for investors, for executives. Here's what we found. Everybody likes to look at number four. Let's restructure HR, specialists, generalists, working with agility. You know what? It doesn't drive results. Number one and number 10. Does our HR department have the right reputation? Do we have a reputation focused on creating value for others? And number 10, it's not the structure, that's number four, it's the relationships. It's not your role clarity, it's your relationships working together. And then number nine becomes the essential driver. What set of skills do we need? And I hope some of you have seen that research. Our headline on skills, and I mentioned it in the study, uh, that we've done. It's this study, HR competence. We've done it for 35 years. For years, we looked at competencies as a role, business, partner, change, agent, credible, activist. Today, we look at the competence of HR as a verb. You're not a business partner. You accelerate business. You're not a change agent. You're, you're not an HR uh, expert. You advance human capability. You mobilize information. And we believe that those HR competencies, well, we've tested it, drive results. Whoa, let's just take, we have a few minutes, we have three minutes before uh, we're gonna turn it over to questions, but Michaela, and then we'll turn it to Andrea. Joe, anything you would add before we do the questions that I've not covered as well as I could have in that discussion? I covered a lot. I'll come back to the summary, Dave, at the end, but let's let's take some questions. Okay. Okay, so first question, uh, what are the best ways to measure the effectiveness of HR initiatives to check if we are on the right path in terms of contributing to the organization's success in the marketplace? 
there's three ways. One is you measure activity. Did I do it? How many people got trained? Two, you measure a perception. What did I think of the training? And we'll do a survey of this, one to five. Did you like the training? Three, did I learn anything? Behavior change. I think the fourth most critical way to measure and what we believe in, those are all good, by the way. <laughs> the uh, did it change my behavior? Did it change my mindset? Did it? Did it? Uh, did I do things differently? But we love to correlate the activity with the outcome. So, in our ability to improve HR through human capability, we say, "Here's ten initiatives in talent. Which of those initiatives will guide your company to better deliver customer value?" And we can now track that. And so the value, and I love the question, the value of tracking the outcome is that we're not just getting your perception. Did you like it? Because I could like, that's kind of the assumption question that the doctor asked. I like that a lot, but it didn't make any difference. Let's look at what makes a difference with our customers, with our investors, with our social citizenship, with our strategic reinvention. That's the work that we feel so strongly about. And I think we think that's the next wave of the analytics game. We call it guidance. And uh, Harrison has done some great work with an organizational guidance system that will let you uh, figure out some of that work. A great question from Steve Hatch. How do you pull an organization or company out of a reactionary cost only focus and help our HR function be more broadly focused on human capability and strategy? Steve, it's a great question. And 20-60-20, 20% 20, 60, 20. 20 of the time the executives are doing it, 20%, no matter what you do, it's not going to happen. And you're going, well, it's not 20, it's 15. But think of those two extremes of a distribution. For that middle 60%, Steve, I don't think we start with HR. I said it before. I think we go to the executive team and say, what do you have to do to succeed in the marketplace? Eastman Kodak, you had to reinvent. You had to get out of film. You had to let go of what your legacy was, what your assumption was. You had to get into information and imaging. Toys R Us, you had to get out of big boxes. You had to get into the online sales that would compete with Amazon. I think, Steve, we start with marketplace, customer, investor, and then we show how linking the HR human capability initiatives to that agenda will be helpful. And then the final thing is, I really, and it's come up in three questions, the importance of prioritization. One of the mistakes we make is we try to be all things to all people. I love the Walmart story. When Sam Walton started Walmart, he wanted to open 50 stores. In the United States, and many of you are not from here, there's 50 states. Do you open one per state or 50 in one state? And the answer was 50 in one state. We prioritize, we focus. And that's that prioritization. I, I shared earlier with Gerard's question, we have a three-step formula, impact on customers, investors, status, how well we doing, it has impact and we're doing it well. Well, we don't need to improve. It has impact, we're not doing well, we need to improve. And third, variance. There's not a standard answer here. Um, in, in a lot of compensation, the payroll system, there's no variance. The cost of payroll is about the same, whichever firm you do to outsource it. So we're not gonna get success there. We wanna build an opportunity set. Maybe one more and then we'll turn it to Andrea, if that's okay. Or we can turn it to Andrea as you wish now. Uh, why don't we do one quick one? So uh, Ramesh asked a question, uh, Dave, in your opinion, will HR continue to be managed by HR professionals or will we see more of business leaders taking over HR? Yes, both. I think to, I've often been asked, the test of good HR is the HR person becomes CEO. That grates me a little bit. That says HR is not a legitimate career. HR is legitimate. We don't have to be CEO or business leader to be good. I think the boundary between, I, I saw a picture a few, it was probably six months ago. There were three people. They happened to be women. They happened to be chief HR officers. And this gets back to the assumption uh, that the doctor raised. And the, and the comment was, what do you see? Do you see gender? Do you see HR? Or do you see a business person? My answer is the first thing I see in identity is, and these were happened to be CHROs I knew. I saw three exceptional business leaders exceptional business leaders who happen to be in HR and who happen to be female and you manage those, those are important. But I hope that we have HR people who have the skill set that came up earlier to create value in that marketplace. Thank, thank you, Dave, for um, your summary of uh, human capability and, and your unique skill of pulling this together, synthesizing, integrating. 
And for those on the webinar and our, our clients here, our, our um, colleagues as well, we wanted to have Andrea share some other opportunities we have where we feature Dave and in the various aspects of human capability where you can learn even more. So Andrea, thank you. Yes, thank you, Joe. And a huge thank you to Dave for your generosity of your knowledge and research and time and thought leadership. It's, I mean, can you guys even believe that he's answered all of the 40 submitted questions? You guys, it's just incredible the amount of time um, that Dave has put into teaching us here today. And on behalf of Dave and everyone at RBL, I'm super excited to introduce you to our results-based guided learning programs created to allow you to continue to learn from Dave and the RBL team to help you apply what you've learned here today and in these programs to really move the human capability uh, agenda forward. And all of these programs are available as either open cohorts or private internal cohorts for your organization. So, you know, we love the question and which of the four pathways do you and your organization need to focus on to drive that stakeholder value? And as Dave said, you know, we have OGS, so ask us about that. But, you know, looking here, you know, where, where do you need to focus on today? So these are four of our global open programs that are starting very soon. And so I'd love just to share you, share with you a little bit about those. So our Dave Ulrich HR Academy, that is an award-winning academy. Um, it's for all HR leaders to learn how HR creates value from the outside in and how to actually deliver that business impact for stakeholders. The Dave Ulrich Talent Academy is for business leaders looking to develop the tactics and skills to build talent and human capability. So our Leadership Code Academy is for all levels of leaders to know, do, and be successful leaders in the five domains that Dave shared with us today that really drive that business results. And then we have Really exciting news. The Leading for HR Excellence Masterclass is Dave's newest program. And this is for our senior HR leaders to really understand and implement the 10 critical dimensions of a high-performing HR department. Again, that Dave so, so beautifully and yet quickly touched upon today. So if you're wanting to dive deep in with Dave in that masterclass, please join us. It starts October 23rd. So again, each of these programs is delivered in a virtual blended format with online modules and live RBL consultant facilitated sessions. So on the next slide, um, you can see really quickly a, a glimpse of what a guiding learning sprint looks like, which you can see you're going to see videos from Dave um, and other experts two to four minutes. They're quick. They're simple. They're easy. Um, you're going to get readings, case studies, assessments. You're going to be part of an online discussion with your small cohort. So on the next slide, we're going to share, here are the benefits of learning from this format. So you're going to get flexibility. These short sprint exercises you can complete on your own time and really easily, you're gonna get instruction again from Dave and industry leaders. You're gonna get those live facilitated sessions with breakouts and conversations on how do you apply the principles you're learning through the content. You're gonna get that individual development and that collaborative piece where you're gonna work as a cohort and in either internally again as an organization or as that global open cohort to discuss what you've learned and work together. And all these programs are accredited. So on the next slide, um, we do want just to invite you to join us um, and be part of our continued learning. And um, this QR code right here, if you have your phones, take them out, take a picture, and you can immediately download um, details of each of these academies, the modules, the outcomes. And, and um, if you don't have your phone, I just sent you over in your inbox right now should be an email for me, andrea.allen at rbl.net. Um, it has, again, Dave's entire slide deck. So if you didn't get to download that, um, that is going to be included. You're going to get uh, access to all of this content. And also included there is a special promotion for all registrants of this webinar here today. So. Thank you. We hope that you can join us to learn more. And back to you, um, 
Dave, for your final you know, final summary. Uh, it's hard to believe how much we've covered in the last uh, 55 minutes. Our message is simple. We want to help you create value. The question we started with at the bottom, how can I create more value as an individual or as an HR team? Our answer is embedded in those four themes. Now is the time to invent HR. There's new assumptions of work. What do they mean? Number one, change the way we think and approach HR. It's not about HR. It's about creating value. This webinar, the strength of it is not what we know. It's how what we know helps you. How will it help you have better discussions and live those assumptions and be successful with customers and investors? Number two, what do we in HR bring to the discussion? Talent, organization, and leadership. And number three, how do we upgrade ourselves as individuals and the HR department? It would be great in chat if you could just, what did you hear that works? We're gonna look more at your questions. You'll get a copy of the questions we answered. The assumption I wanna leave with and then turn it back to Joe. I love to ask people, what's the best year of your life? And sometimes it's the year I left home, when I was 12 years old, when I finished college, when I got married, when I had a child, when my child left home, my old, youngest child. Uh, somebody said once, when I got divorced, our RBL assumption is very simple. The best year of your life is the next 12 months. The best year is the next 12 months. We continue to learn. Let us learn with you. Let us explore with you. The best is yet ahead. Now is the time for what we call human capability that will create value for all stakeholders. This is a journey we think is worth taking and we hope you'll join us in that journey. And I'll leave this slide up, Joe, as you, uh, as you finish. Yeah, again, thanks, Dave. And uh, let's all stay connected in the best year of our life <laughs> next year. These are ways to stay connected with us. Uh, follow Dave on LinkedIn. You have Dave's weekly newsletter, which is a new event and uh, very popular. So subscribe to that. You can follow RBL on LinkedIn. And then we'll have the webinar slides sent to you. Or here's the link. You can get the final copy. It's on, on our website as well. And then please... Uh, share your thoughts on just a final survey with three or four questions as we leave. Again, we thank you very much and uh, have a great day.